Hi, I'm Carl. In this video, we're going to have a look at questions 49 to 54 of section 3 of the Purple Booklet. This is a question about the pineal gland, which is described as a small body deep within the brain. Now, there's plenty of information. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I have copied out figure 1. Uh, as we need to, I'll talk through any of the information that's there. So I'd hope to have the question in front of you for this one. 49 asks, of the following, the information provided most strongly suggests that light increases the size of the ovaries, mainly by which mechanism? So I want to talk about the first bullet point, which says when a female rat is exposed to continuous light over several weeks, the weight of its pineal gland decreases. At the same time, the weight of the ovaries increases and the length of the oestrous cycle shortens. So we know that there's a sort of negative correlation or an inverse correlation uh, between the size of the pineal gland and the weight of the ovaries. And we're looking at what can increase the ovaries, the size and the weight of the ovaries. So the pineal gland uh, produces melatonin. And figure one, which is what I've, I've written out here, is um, the path by which this happens. And the rate limiting step in this is what I've highlighted. It's this methoxylating enzyme. So with that information in mind, uh, let's look at figure two. Comparing group 1, which is the control group, and group 3, which is the blinded group, um, we see that the amount of light that is present can affect the activity of this enzyme. So by decreasing the activity of this enzyme, we can increase the size and the weight of the ovaries. So that means that the answer for 49 is A. This is really just by putting some of that information together. Question 50 says, suppose that for experiments summarized in figure 2, another group of rats has its pineal enzyme production inhibited. Figure 2 suggests that compared with the control, HIOMT activity of this group would be what? Okay, so if we were looking at how uh, the production of the enzyme might affect it, let's have a look at um, the second last bullet point on page 62. It's this note that says, in the following questions, it's assumed that the activity of an enzyme depends on the degree of activation of existing molecules and or on the level of enzyme due to its rate of production. Knowing this and knowing that the HIOMT is a rate limiting reaction, um, we can get an idea as to how light and dark might change it. So again, comparing group one, and group three, we can see that the blinded um, group proves that being in the light can decrease the activity of HIOMT. Therefore, if we were looking at um, figure two and supposing we had a group of rats that had this enzyme inhibited, the production of this enzyme inhibited, we would get um, less in the dark and we would expect it to be unchanged in the light. The reason for this, we have it less in the dark because um, it would not be produced as much because of the inhibition of its production. But it would also be unchanged in the light, and this is the important bit, because it is already at a sort of minimum in the light, as we can see in the control group. So that means that for question 50, um, we would get D. For question 51, then, it says, according to the information provided so far, which one of the following could be part of the explanation of how light increases the size of the ovaries. Okay, so let's have a read through the different options here. A talks about light decreasing the inhibitory effect of HIOMT production on the nerve pathways that act on the pineal gland. Well, if it was decreasing the inhibitory effect, that would be overall stimulating it, right, if you're decreasing the inhibitory effect. So that would be the opposite of what we'd expect. Answer B is the opposite of that, it says that light increases the inhibitory effect of HIMT production, which makes sense that it's more inhibited in the light if we look at the control group in group one, figure two, and compare that to the blinded group, group three, we can see that that would make sense. So the answer for this one is going to be B. But just to check it, we'll say, uh, we'll look at C, light increasing the stimulatory effect of HIOMT production. Well, we can see that in the light, that the HIOMT activity is at the minimum activity level, not at a maximum. So we know that can't be the case. And of course, D isn't right either because B would work. So the answer for this one is definitely B. 
Questions 52 to 54 add another graph and some more information we have to deal with. Question 52 says, which of the following best describes the relationship between two and three? Well, I'm going to draw a little bit of this diagram out here. Um, and it's the bit that I thought best answered this question. If we're looking at the HIOMT activity, it has a, a waveform that looks a little like this. When we look at the serotonin activity, it seems to look a little bit more like this. The difference between these two phases, and we're just going to say this is the time axis, if we're looking at um, what the difference is here, this is going to be in darkness. And this is just the normal lighting. As we can see, they are similar phenomena and they are consistent with each other in timings. You know, the peak of one is equal to the trough of the other, even though I haven't drawn it too well here. You can see that they are similar ph phenomena and they're linked throughout the entirety of the graph. So looking at figure three, you can say definitely they are similar. But it's this bit here that confused me because I would have thought that these look a little inconsistent. You know, they're the break, there's a break between um, the two here, but um, because there is this temporal consistency, they are linked up. It doesn't mean that one is directly linked to another. Um, instead, you need to remember that, of course, um, serotonin is uh, something which is used to produce melatonin in this. This is why we were given figure one. Um, none of this information is irrelevant. And the activity um, of this enzyme, of course, would depend on the concentration of serotonin. If there is no serotonin to produce N-acetylserotonin, then the enzyme wouldn't be able to work. So they are consistent with each other and they are similar phenomena, which means the answer to 52 is going to be A. Despite this part being different to this part, you just need to remember what serotonin, um, what role that plays in this question. Okay, so 53 says which of the following statements is most consistent with the figures. So A says continuous lighting overcomes the effect of denervation on HIOMT activity. So if we have a look at the period of continuous lighting uh, in figure three, we can see that there's going to be low activity for the entirety of that. And then if we look at den denervation, uh, there'll be high activity. If we look at B then, it says continuous lighting overcomes the effect of denervation on the serotonin level. Well, the denervation, again, um, has a different activity level to the continuous lighting. So they don't overcome each other, they're not related. If we look at C, then it says continuous darkness overcomes the effect of internally generated brain rhythms or on HIOMT activity. So looking at the period of continuous darkness, um, we can see that the natural rhythm that we can imply from the serotonin wave is disrupted and it is overcome in this case. So C seems to be the best candidate, but just to have a look at D now, it says continuous darkness overcomes the effect of internally generated brain rhythms on serotonin level. Well, in the period of continuous darkness or blinding, we can see that the serotonin level continues to oscillate at a normal rate despite the change in the lighting. Therefore, um, it won't be D either. So with all that in mind, we can definitely say that the answer for 53 is going to be C. And finally, with question 54, it says, which of the following statements is most supported by the figures? HIOMT activity. Um, and then it gives a couple of uh, statements. So let's, let's go through them. A says that it depends directly on the level of serotonin. Well, straight away from the diagram, we can see it doesn't quite of course, there is a link, as I said, because serotonin does play a role in the same pathway and it provides the fuel for the enzyme. However, looking at the diagram, we can see that they are disjuncted. Um, looking at B then, it says it depends directly on the level of lighting, but not nerve input. Well, nerve input can be sort of seen by the denervation phase. And we can see that within normal lighting, um, the level of HIOMT activity doesn't oscillate like it did before once the nerve was taken away. If we look at C, we can see the HIOMT activity and serotonin level both depend on nerve inputs to the pineal. So again, we can have a look at denervation phase on the right hand side. 
If this wasn't true, then we'd expect that the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the diagrams to look the same, as if the nerve inputs um, were not important. But we can see that here, that they both certainly do depend um, on the input from the nerves. So the answer for this one is C. But just to rule it out, let's look at D. It says, HIOMT activity follows a pattern consistent with the conversion of serotonin to HIOMT. Well, this one's worded a little, um, it's, it's a little tricky because you need to remember that serotonin, of course, is involved in this pathway here in figure one. But HIOMT is not one of the ingredients in it. It's not one of the intermediates. Instead, it's just an enzyme that converts phenacetyl serotonin into melatonin. So it's not an option. So it's definitely not going to be D. That means that overall, the question 54, the answer has to be C. So that was a tough one because there's quite a lot of information. So I hope I was able to explain that in a way that helped. Thanks for watching.